So anyone else like to chant? <clears throat> Yeah. Uh-huh. 
sides are his ears, and physical sound is his sense of hearing. His nostrils are the two Ashvin Kumars, and material fragrance is his sense of smell. His mouth is the blazing fire. So I'll say then you please repeat. 
His arms are the demigods headed by Indra. His arms are the demigods headed by Indra. The ten directional sides are his ears. The ten directional sides are his ears. Physical sound is his sense of hearing. The physical sound is his sense of hearing. His nostrils are the two Ashvini Kumars. His nostrils are the two Ashvini Kumars. Material fragrance is his sense of smell. Material fragrance is his sense of smell. His mouth is the blazing fire. His mouth is the blazing fire. So Srila Prabhupada's purport. The description of the gigantic form of the personality of God made in the eleventh chapter of the Bhagavad Gita is further explained here in the Srimad Bhagavatam. The description in the Bhagavad Gita, 1130, runs as follows, quote, O oh, Vishnu, I see you devouring all people in your blazing mouths and covering all the universe by your immeasurable rays, scorching the worlds you are manifest. Mm -hmm. In that way, that's an end, end quote there. In that way, Srimad Bhagavatam is the postgraduate study of the student of the Bhagavad Gita. Both of them are the science of Krishna, the absolute truth. And so, they are interdependent. The conception of the Varat Purusha, or the gigantic form of the Supreme Lord, is said to include all the dominating demigods, as well as the dominated living beings. Even the minutest part of a living being is controlled by the empowered agency of the Lord. Since the demigods are included in the gigantic form of the Lord, worship of the Lord, so they worship the Lord, whether in His gigantic material conception or in His eternal transcendental form as Lord Shri Krishna, also appears, excuse me, also appeases the demigods and all the other parts and the uh, parts and parcels, as much as watering the root of a tree distributes energy to all the tree's other parts. Consequently. For a materialist, also, worship of the universal gigantic form of the Lord leads one to the right path. One need not risk being misled by approaching many demigods for fulfillment of the different desires. The real entity is the Lord Himself, and all others are imaginary, for everything is included in Him only. The, the verses, uh, his arms are the demigods headed by Indra, the ten directional sides are his ears, and physical sound is his sense of hearing. His nostrils are the two Ashvini Kumars, and material fragrance is his sense of smell. His mouth is the blazing fire of material, uh, is the blazing fire. Narayana Namaskritya Narang Chaiva Narutamam before reciting the Srimad Bhagavatam, which is our very means of conquest, we should first offer our respectful obeisances to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Lord Narayan. To Narayan Narayan Rishi, the supermost human being. Mother Saraswati, the goddess of learning. Srila Vyasadeva, the author. To Srila Prabhupada, our spiritual master. Nama Om Vishnu Padaya, Krishna Pastaya Bhutale. Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinam. Namaste Sarasati Devi, Gauravani Pacharane, Devi Sesha Srinivari Vasvita, Devi Sutarane. So, this chapter is entitled The First Step in God Realization. Sukadev Goswami is uh, uh, explaining. Uh, to Sukadev Goswami, this very important moment that he's on the threshold of death and he can't make a mistake here, this last moment. He, he has the, the opulence of knowing that when he's going to die. Most of us, we don't know and that would be nice to know. <clears throat> I wouldn't like our brother to say that, you know, it's nice when maybe you hate to say it, but if you had some kind of disease like Oh, well, a, a disease, and it, you know there's a gradual dimin diminishing, you, you have a sense of time. But it could happen at any time. So, one should be always prepared. So, but Sugadev Goswami is first describing that this, everything we see 
is, um, is a part of Krishna. I mean, it's like, um, I was thinking about this the other day, there's that expression, you know, what do you give to the person who has everything? Well, this sort of ups the ante. What do you give to the person who is everything? Because Krishna is everything we see. And um, as a materialist, a materialist only sees matter. And he sees matter as something to exploit for his own enjoyment. Um, we all have our own sort of field of activity or realm that we can operate in. And we have strengths and weaknesses and talents mm. by which we can try to squeeze out some pleasure from this material world. But it never ends well. Everything we try to occupy gradually is crumbling, it gradually dissipates. And we keep thinking, well, maybe it's this thing over here. Maybe I just haven't done that. And then the uh, civilization keeps telling us, no, 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 you just need to adjust it a little bit. And then after we've sort of exploited the whole material world, then they start, so well, let's go to another planet. We'll go to the moon. And back in the 70s, they were actually, one airline was selling tickets. For, uh, I think it was Pan Am who went out of business. I don't know if the people got their money back. <laughs> but they, they were selling tickets to the moon. And they were actually selling mining rights on the moon. I remember actually one time, when I, this was in the late 60s, I was living in Boston. I was just starting to meet the devotees. And, um, but I didn't know about the whole, you know, what Prabhupada said about the moon. But I, and personally, when I saw it, I thought it looked really hokey, very suspicious. But um, they, they, I was listening to this, I was in this little cafe, and the guy behind the counter was saying, uh, yeah, you know, the moon is ours now. We put our flag on it. Um, the moon is America. I think, what the heck is that? He was like, what do you mean the moon is America? I mean, what does that mean? So, um, you know, they, they just see everything in terms of their own... Uh, sense gratification. They were even, one point, thinking, uh, with these laser lights, you could, um, uh, they could put, um, like, advertising on the moon. They actually speculated that it was possible to put, a, like, an ad on the moon with laser lights, like, enjoy Coca-Cola. You imagine some romantic situation out of the beach, and you see the full moon flashing, Enjoy Coke <laughs> <laughs> on the moon. I mean, it's ridiculous. The, 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 their uh, attempts are actually kind of um, ludicrous and foolish. So here, Sukadev Goswami is explaining that no, actually everything is not only a part of Krishna, it is Krishna. There's a very good verse in the sixth canto. Atai yakam anavabhanam vikalpa rahitam swayam. And I want to get the translation right. Uh, I wasn't here then. I have to use two present glasses. <clears throat> um, Medicare doesn't cover eyes. So the translation to that, it, it sort of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the living entities, the material energy, the spiritual energy, the entire creation are all individual substances. In the ultimate analysis, however, together they constitute the Supreme One, the Personality of Godhead. Therefore, those who are advanced in spiritual knowledge see unity and diversity. For such advanced persons, the Lord's bodily declarations, His name, His fame, His attributes and forms, and the weapons in His hand, are manifestations of the strength of his potency. According to their elevated spiritual understanding, the omniscient Lord, who manifests various forms, <coughs> is present everywhere. May he always protect us everywhere from all calamities. And the verse before is, the subtle and gross cosmic manifestation is material, but nevertheless it is non-different from the Supreme Personality of God. Because he is ultimately the cause of all causes, sarvakarna karna. Ishwar Parma Krishna Satchidananda Vigraha Anadya Adya Govinda Sarva Karna Karna. He's the cause of all causes. And, but he said, cause and effect are factually one because the cause is present in the effect. 
Therefore, the absolute truth, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, can destroy all our dangers by any of its potent parts. And there's a couple of interesting verses in the purport. You know, a person highly elevated in spiritual knowledge knows that nothing exists but the Supreme Personality of Godhead. This is also confirmed in Bhagavad Gita 9.4, where Lord Krishna says, Mayam tatam idam sarvam, indicating that everything we see is an expansion of his energy. That is confirmed in the Vishnu Purana 122.52. Eka desa, si tasya yagnir, josna vishtarini yata, parasha brahmana saktis, tate dam aikyam jagat, as a fire, although existing in one place, can expand its light and heat everywhere. So the omnipotent Lord, the Supreme Personality of God, although uh, um, situated in his spiritual abode, expands himself everywhere in both the material and spiritual worlds by his various en energies. And then there's a really nice verse about the Holy Name. Nama Chintamani Krishna's Chaitanya Rasa Vigraha Purnam Sudo Nitya Mukto Binatvam Nama Namani. The holy name of the Lord is fully identical with the Lord. Not partially. The word Purna means complete. The Lord is omnipotent and omniscient. And similarly, His name, form, qualities, paraphernalia, everything pertaining to Him are complete, pure, eternal, and free from material contamination. The prayer to the ornaments and the carriers of the Lord is not false, for they are as good as the Lord. This is a prayer that was given to uh, Indra by Vishwarupa before he went to do battle with uh, Vrithrasura. It's called the Narayana Kavacha shield. And so, the, the, uh, what's interesting is that, so, Krishna has nothing to do with the material world. Only, the only reason he is here is because of us, because he cares about us. This material energy is our playground. We come here that we want to try to be um, something that we're really not. You know, we're, we're eternally the servants of the servants, but we come here to try to um, be proprietors, be Ishwaras, to be the supreme enjoyers. But we're frustrated at every step of the way. And, and I mean, they, the materialists try to make a religion out of pantheism or ecology, like the, the Green Movement. They, their idea of taking care of the material nature is for their own sense gratification. They want to maintain it so they can enjoy it, and their children and their grandchildren can enjoy it. They don't see it. It's a godless religion, basically, that they make out of it. They turn it, it's, it's a religion. Their religion is to worship nature and take care of it. It may be in the mode of goodness, but it's still, uh, they don't understand that this is Krishna. Not only is he behind it, he, this is Krishna, everywhere, existing. And our business is to try to um, connect again. And so here is Sukadev Goswami, at the time of Maharaj Prickett's impending death, he's first explaining to him that this entire material creation is the Supreme Lord, and you can meditate on him in that way. I mean, Mars Brickett had an entire, the entire planet. He was the emperor of the planet. He could exploit this world for, uh, for many, many hundreds of years at least, uh, and he probably could have counteracted this uh, curse, but he had no desire to do that, because he knew ultimately everything comes to an end. We must, you know, when one is born, death is certain. So, he already understands this point. And here's another thing, is that, you know, generally people judge one another by their external situations. Here's the emperor of the world, and here comes Sukadev Goswami. He doesn't own anything. If you did a background check on him, he probably wouldn't look too good. I mean, he didn't even have clothes. But yet, he saw his spiritual qualities. He didn't see it in terms of how he was dressed or how he, um, how much wealth he had. In this material world, we're all looking for uh, who we are. We want to know, what am I? Who am I? And what we do is we project 
false egos. We hear about some character in a novel, or we see some television show, so, show and we, that personality in that show, we like their qualities. And so we become a conglomeration of all of these different kinds of false egos. If you watch people at a mall or downtown, you see the way they dress, the way they talk. They're not real. They're not, they don't know who they are. They're trying to be somebody else. A conglomeration, their own personal version of it. Um, that's why the first time I saw Prabhupada, it was like this picture right here. It was just like this, that for the ad for the movie. He, he, was, he, was, he was in color and everything else was like shades of gray. Just like that. That's the way I saw him. And he was in reality. And everyone else, everything around him, was various shades of illusion. They didn't know who they were. He knew exactly who he was. He knew exactly who Krishna was. He knew his purpose in life. He knew how to serve Krishna. And he knew who, who all of we were, who we all were. And he was um, coming from reality as an ambassador to bring us back to reality, to engage us in our true identity. And this is the process, by hearing and chanting the holy name attentively. In the Saranagati, Bhaktivinoda Thakur, he, he's talking about his, uh, humility mainly. Um, but also he, he says that the most serious offense when chanting the holy name is inattentiveness. So, because what, what can we give to someone who is everything? What can we give to Krishna? I mean, ultimately we have to give him our devotional love, our service. But in this case, that service is that we're attentive. Just like when we're chanting our, uh, the holy name, we have to be attentive while we chant. We have to try to control the mind. And trying to control the mind is an extremely difficult thing. Uh, there's a nice story about two brothers. I, I, I read it in a book uh, that Dina Bana put together. And one, one of the brothers was very, um, very pious and he had studied scripture and became expert in the Srimad Bhagavatam and he would recite it in the villages. And the other brother was uh, quite licentious, very uh, debauched, you know. He had no sen uh, sense of spiritual purpose. And then he died in some tragic way. And he, he was a very cruel person as well. And he ended up having to uh, suffer living as a ghost. So he comes to his brother in the ghost form, and he's really suffering. He's really, really in pain. And he, he's begging his brother, please, you have to help me. I was wrong. I've ruined my life. Uh, and I should have listened to you. And, he said, and the brother says, okay, I can arrange. Uh, you get a bamboo stick with seven knots. And then you put yourself inside the bamboo. Because he was about to recite the Shema Bhagavatam for seven days. Bhagavat Sapta, but not as a business. And so he gets inside the, the bamboo and then his brother recites the first day to the village, and after the first day, the first knot goes pop. It's like that. And he notices, but they don't, they don't ask him. The second day, after the second day, bam! That one pops. And then it keeps going on like this. Finally, on the seventh day, there's boom! And you, then you, they see this brilliant light flying out of the bamboo rod, straight up to Vaikuntha. And they go, what? what was that? Well, that was my brother. And he was in the ghost form, and I was asked, he asked me for, to help him get free of this. So I had him attend the class in this form. And they went, well, that's nepotism. <laughs> <laughs> he got the mercy. Well, we, we, we didn't get 
you know, salvation. We didn't go back to, to Vaikuntha. He said, no, my mercy is equal. I distributed it to everyone equally. And he said, but the difference is, he was in so much uh, anxiety, so much pain and suffering, he was paying attention. And so they go, really? He said, yeah, when, when I'm giving, when you were there, what were you thinking about? Your business? Your family? What you were going to eat for lunch? Your mind was elsewhere. He was completely there, sold out, listening. <clears throat> and they go, oh, yeah, that's true, I was kind of drifting away. Yeah. Well, let's do it again. <laughs> so, I mean, the point is, is that um, when you're in distress, you know, you really do get yourself, um, um, you know, you're really, you know, you're just begging, you, you have what I call dropity moments, when you have no alternative. You can't, we, I, my wife and I found ourselves in a situation where we couldn't stay, we couldn't leave. We were just at nothing. Everything taken. It. it was just, just Krishna, you're our only hope. I, I can't fix this. In that moment, then, one by one, things happened. There was nothing else I could do. It had to come from Krishna. And He was there for us. He carried what we lacked. The, and you know, just at Draupadi, she was, she, she looked to her husbands and they couldn't do anything. Bhima wanted to, but the others held him back. He looked, she looked to Bhishma, she looked to Bhishma, Dronacharya, but they were bound by the code. They couldn't do anything. She could see that they, nobody, she had no shelter there. Everybody who should have protected her didn't. Then she tried to personally fight against, uh, who was it, Dushashan? She was personally trying to fight back, but she had no hope. So finally she just realizes, I can't do this. So she just lets go. Krishna! And then Krishna comes in the form of cloth and saves her. Saves her. So, um, here's, Mar uh, here's Sukadev Goswami describing that everything you see in this material world, you can see it in relationship to Krishna. And this is basically for our benefit. Because our, obviously Parikit Maharaj was willing to renounce the whole empire. But he's describing that everything you see, because even on the way back to Godhead, I've heard it said that some, uh, in some cases you have to go through the celestial worlds. And if you see anything, like you look and say, oh, that looks nice, then you get stuck at that point. So, he's trying to give him a complete education of and thus, that there is nothing that, that's here in this material world that isn't Krishna, but it's in the inferior energy. It has form, it has shape, because Krishna is there. And why is Krishna there? Because we are here. As soon as the soul leaves the body, it deteriorates, it just crumbles. It's the soul, and the soul is a tiny... I mean, it, it, it's a, the, the, the description is that it's 10,000 uh, uh, 10, uh, parts of a tip of a hair. What is the tip of a hair? Can you even see the tip of a hair and then divide it into 10,000 parts? That's the size of us. We are so insignificant. At least I am. We're so small. And when we're here in the material world, we get caught up. I mean, who thought when you left the, the spiritual world that you would find yourself, you know, in these ridiculous... Do you think that spirit soul that occupied the body of uh, Adolf Hitler thought, yeah, I want to go to the material world and become a mass murderer. I, I want to, I, you know, I want to go to the material world and become uh, a worm in stool. I want to become a hog. No, the, the spirit soul has no idea what he's asking for. Because the three, it's like an ocean. And in the ocean, there are various currents. I grew up right by the ocean on Long Island. And you go out, 
if it was a bad day, there was like these rip tides, rip currents. If, you know, your friends and family are on the beach. You go out into the ocean, and after a few minutes, you don't realize it so much, but you're drifting. And when you turn around and look, you can't see them. You can't find them. You've been carried away by the currents. You don't know how you got here. I mean, there's so many places in my life where, personally, I never thought I was going to be involved in retail. I mean, I, I don't know how that happened. I didn't want to be a salesperson. I, if I, when I woke up in the morning, I thought, no, I'm not a salesperson. I, I'm a facilitator. I'm facilitating people's dreams. I couldn't possibly think that I'm going to be selling. I hated the thought of it. When, I, when you're growing up, I didn't want to grow up to be a salesperson. <laughs> Actually, I didn't really know what I wanted. But when I saw the Hare Krishnas, people kept saying, what do you want to do? What do you want to do? And I saw the devotees chanting in the street. They seemed really happy. I said, because I always said, I just want to be happy. And I saw them, I said, yeah, I want to do that. I want to sing and dance in the street. That's, that'll be my occupation. That sounds good to me. And <clears throat> so I signed on. I mean, but that is the Krishna Consciousness Movement. It came to save, um, you know, aimlessly hopeless souls like myself. Just at the right moment, Prabhupada came. So anyway, um, the universal form is a very difficult thing for us to comprehend, but the purpose of it is for us to understand that Krishna is everywhere, everything is Krishna, everything's coming from Krishna, and the only thing that we have that we can give him is our attention, pay attention, and then render some, some devotional service uh, under the direction of a bona fide spiritual master. So does anyone have anything they'd like to add? Any questions, comments? Realizations? Nothing. Okay. Yes? <laughs> Who was in the Prabhupada movie that said, Here comes Prabhupada, and he was like the ambassador from another planet? What's that? W were you in the Prabhupada movie? No. Huh? No. You know, that, that was uh, uh, Chuktananda. Hmm. Yeah, he was like an ambassador from. Uh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I actually. I, I describe uh, in the memories though. I did use that as a, you know, they ask you what was your first experience with Prabhupada, and I said, well, it was like seeing color TV for the first time. Because in the fifties we had black and white TV, and then so all of a sudden, the first time I saw Prabhupada, it was like it's the first time I'm seeing color. I mean, he was so full of, he was vibrant. And I had been, in, uh, in college, I had been studying theater. So in theater, they're always uh, saying that you should study the motive. That what is, you, when you're doing a play, the character, what is his motive from walking from A to B? You know, what is, he, uh, you know, what is his inner monologue? That's, that was the expression. So I, I was always watching people and studying them like that. And when I saw Prabhupada, I could see this person was in reality, he, he wasn't playing a part. He walked into the Brooklyn Temple and uh, he wasn't just going to see some, you know, marble deity form, he was going to see Rana, Rana and Govinda. He, you could feel it. It was a, fe you know, and, and here's another point. This is a mystical process. So, when we, we have to try to uh, absorb our mind in Krishna's pastimes, His holy name, um, our service, and we have to use our intelligence. Prabhupada said the intelligence is the closest thing to the soul. So we have to use our intelligence to understand this philosophy that will protect us. And, um, <clears throat> but <clears throat> it's not like you can just mentally, by some mental gymnastics, figure it out who I am in the spiritual world. It's by reciprocation to our devotional service. Like the story of, um, what was his name, uh, Dukhi Krishna. He was just, he was 
He, his Siksha Guru was Jiva Goswami, the greatest philosopher in Vaishnava history. But he was, his service was to go to Seva Kunj and dust it and uh, sweep it. And by that humble service, he gradually was introduced into the internal uh, realm and learned out, found out what his internal, uh, eternal, internal pastimes or relationship is. Uh, in the spiritual world. It isn't like you intellectually can jump, climb to, to uh, that realization. It has to be reciprocation. The, the thing is, is with the mind, this is a really interesting example. Um, I was living in Tennessee, they have black walnut trees. They're like weeds, they grow everywhere. And um, the black walnut, has anyone ever seen a black walnut? The uh, outside, you were there. The, the outside of it is like a lime green. It's a very soft covering. And you can just, with your thumb, you just, it just comes right off. There's a second shell underneath. And that's, what, that's how you get to the nut or the, what you want. And so in this analogy, the, uh, the green covering is the material body, which is very easily punctured, damaged very perishable. The second shell is the mind and the intelligence. And it goes with the soul wherever it goes. It's practically eternal. As long as we've been here, that mind and intelligence has been going with us. And it's not easy to crack it. You, you have to take a hammer and just smash it and smash it. And then you pick out, gradually drag it out, the nut. And it's very delect delectable, but in that case, I'm set, using this as an example, that the soul is trapped in this very hard, intensely stubborn mind and intelligence. It's subtle, but it's almost impossible to get through it. And it has to be purified. And, um, so, and, and, and then you can, the soul becomes free from all of its, you know, lifetimes of desires, lifetimes of... We have no idea what kind of reactions are waiting for us. What, we've, what kind of sinful things, or even pious things that we've done, that could complicate our, our, our path back home. I, I heard one of my older God brothers say that, you know, while you're in the movement and you're under the shelter of the spiritual master, all your karmic reactions is like a big dam and the rushing water of, of sinful reactions are, is being blocked. And if you just for a second kind of look around the dam, it takes your head off. I mean, it's, it's so powerful that as long as we're under the shelter of the lotus feet of the spiritual master, we're protected. So, did you have your hand up? Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. So, like, uh, it's relatively easy to understand that like, all living entities, they're part and parcels of Krishna, and so they're Krishna in some sense, but uh, and when, you talk, when we talk about other material things, or, like even situations and interaction between material elements and just like whatever is there, except of living entities, it's very hard to understand that this is Krishna, and actually even if you understand it with your mind, like universal form, okay, like, skies, Krishna's part, and so on, but it's very hard to realize it, so like, it, I personally have a feeling that I read a book, and like, you can learn it by heart, but still you don't, don't realize it, and it's very hard to really feel this way, that this is Krishna, so if something bad is happening, like this is law of karma, this is also Krishna, you can know it, but it's not possible, at least for me, to really implement, like, have this feeling that this is Krishna, and I don't understand how to develop it even. Uh, so you're saying that you don't understand how it's possible that the sun light is is Krishna or no, is I understand it like, intellectually you understand it but how to feel like this yeah how to feel like that well that comes with time I mean you have to be constantly hearing and chanting I mean but the fact is is that the point of this is is that um, for those of us who can only see the inferior material energy. Sugadev Goswami is describing that what you see, that material energy, 
He's, he, he creates an image that the mountains are this, and I don't remember all the details, but, you know, and the birds are this part of the universal body. And he makes a description of the universal body, and he creates a form for us to see. And when we see that, we think, oh, that's Krishna's... Uh, uh, you know, his, when, the, when the sun rises and sun sets, that's the, like the eyelids mm -hmm. of the Lord. You know, and, and so in this way, you, get a, uh, you can think in terms of this example, and by remembering it and applying it in your, um, when you're looking out onto the material universe, the material world, you apply it and say, oh, in, the, in Sukadev's describe, description of, this, uh, of the Virata Rupa, this is this part of Krishna's body. But, and because the point is, we can't see Krishna. We don't have the eyes to see. Our eyes, these are just lenses over two holes. We don't have spiritual eyes. Prabhupada used to say it has to be, they have to be smeared with the, the ointment of love. Yes? But also, like, I remember in Bhagavad Gita there is a verse which just says that, which says that uh, everything beautiful is just a spark of Krishna, right. but still it's Krishna like, uh, because it's still part of him. But it's very hard to see sometimes beautiful in the material world. You just know that it's all temporary, <coughs> it's all bad. So it's very hard to see this beautiful spark there. You just don't see it. And it's very hard to understand like, okay, birds, this is part of Krishna, but still like killing each other and all these bad mm. things are happening. And it's, it's, <laughs> It's not beautiful, <laughs> so it's very really hard to see Krishna there. I, I understand that. I, does anyone else have an answer for it? Um, <laughs> get a nice magnifying glass. Binoculars are more expensive, but something to enhance your vision and look up closer or more distant or something. And you see, you don't see it as it pertains to you then. Wow. And you see it as a beautiful creation. And you start thinking, well, it's beautiful because Krishna is within it. But you have to, like, maybe you have to get outside of your. Your, your current, you know, sphere of what you can see with your own eyes and something, see it in a way that doesn't pertain to you, invade a different dimension with the magnifying, some lens, you know, that you can see Krishna's creative beauty. So, that's what I did growing up. I had binoculars, I had magnifying glass, and I was in a different world, but, I, you know, I got this realization. Well, I, I think it's just that the point is, is that, you know, like say, when you're thirsty, nothing solves your thirst better than water, you know, the taste of water. And you see uh, someone has a really uh, great ability, like they can play the madanga really well. And you not envy that, but you, oh, you admire it. Because envy means then you want to, you know, it's a, a negative, poisonous. Uh, and, and, and so then you can see, oh, that is Krishna's giving this person if you become envious of it, you're actually becoming envious of Krishna because Krishna says, I am the ability in man. So that ability, that talent has come from Krishna. He's empowered this person to be able to paint this painting or play this drum or to sing very sweetly. So in that way, you see Krishna's gifts. Um, and, so, and, and, just, and the other point is, is that it's like, this is Krishna's house. This is his house. This is his place. If I go into your house, and I start looking around, and I like, I like the furniture, and I think, well, I'm going to take this furniture. I'm gonna be... <laughs> I want this furniture. As a matter of fact, I like those paintings as well. I think, oh, yeah. I mean, let me see what he's got in the refrigerator. Oh, I like this. I'll take the food. I want yeah. what you got. I want what you have. Mm -hmm. So, this is Krishna's, and we come here, and we start looking around thinking, yeah, I can work with this. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to try to enjoy this. But you can't. And that's, the, that's a part of the beauty of Krishna's uh, um, arrangement here. Is that okay? Is that, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes? But do you think that um, Siddhartha Goswami is necessarily advocating that we become realized by um, understanding and worshipping the... No, it, said, it says it's the first step in God realization. So he's recommending, this is a first step, okay? 
So first we've got to realize where you are. This is the material universe. This is the material world. And what this material world is this. And then he starts describing how the different planets are this part of the universal form. And, and so that you understand that this is the first step. And you have to go past that. You know, obviously he's going to go, you know, into the uh, intimate pastimes of the Lord. But we're not at the 10th canon. We're, in, we're still in the, is this, this is the second. So we're still on the lowest speed of the Lord. So this is the first step of understanding. And, um, and one thing is I wanted to just mention is that it was interesting, like yesterday with the discussion about Indra, and not Indra, Nora Namuni, and uh, you know, uh, Manaji couldn't, you know, she didn't recall, she had read it, but she didn't recall it. I didn't see it. No, I didn't yeah, yeah, so, I mean, the thing is, is that Prabhupada oftentimes said, um, the boys would walk in and they'd see him reading the books, and, he said, and they'd ask, why? He said, well, I, I, I didn't write these. Every time I read them, I learn something new. Every the time I, I came in and I said that you know, the, they were going to move after Krishna had been attacked by a couple of baby Krishna, that is, and then the Vaishas were all going to move from this forest to the to Vrindavan forest, because they thought, this is too dangerous. Mm -hmm. Putana had come and someone else had come. They said, this is too dangerous. So then they pack up everything, and then the Vaishas themselves were their own police force, their own security. They didn't have to call the Kshatriyas to come and protect them. We were talking about Varnasha. So I never had read that before. I never noticed. Yeah, you know, and I'm, we're thinking Varna, Varnasha means that these people only do Kshatriya, but these were Vaishas and they had bows and arrows. So I, I had read that story dozens of times. And this. Early this morning, I get up very early, and I had most of my rounds chanted, so I thought I'd take a look at what was going on at the Bhaktivedanta Manor. And uh, I like to do things like that. And um, there was a Manaji giving class, and she was giving the class on um, First Canon, Chapter 9, and it was the 8th verse. And she read something that, I know I've read this, but I know I don't remember this at all. It says here that... Uh, Sukadev Goswami, the famous son and disciple of Sri Vyasadev, who taught, who taught him the, uh, first the Mahabharata, then Srimad Bhagavatam. Sukadev Goswami, now maybe some of you knew this, but I don't remember this. Sukadev Goswami recited 1,400,000 verses of the Mahabharata in the councils of the Gandharvas, Yakshas, and Rakshasas. He re re did anybody know that? Yeah. Does anybody remember that? Yeah. You must have just read it a few months ago, but I didn't know. I, I, didn't, I don't remember ever reading that, but I, I did, and um, and and then it says then he then he uh, recited Shrimad Bhagavat uh, Shrimad Bhagavatam for the first time in the presence of Mars Brickett. He thoroughly studied all the Vedic literatures from his great father. Thus he was completely purified soul by dint of his extensive knowledge. Let's see, I can't see that. There we go. Um, in the principles of religion. From Mahabharata, Sabda Parva 411, it is understood that he was also present in the royal assembly of Maharaj Yudhisthira and at the fasting of Maharaj Brigid. Now I, that, see, that, I, you know, probably... <laughs> <laughs> so, I probably presents things in a way that what we need to know, you know, and it's like, I, and he, I, I, I heard him say once that, you know, if I told you everything, like in terms of deity worship, all the rules and regulations, you'd faint, you know, but, you know, he's given us, a, and I have a very car, car, uh, compartmentalized vision it's like a linear understanding of these personalities. And I'm thinking that Sukadeva Goswami's pastime with his father happened just prior to Maharaj Prickett being cursed. But he was at Maharaj Yudhisthira's uh, assembly. I don't know if this is the Rajasuya sacrifice, or if this was after the battle uh, of Kurukshetra, but it didn't fit my... And I don't know when he was up 
uh, giving the Mahabharata recitation to Gandharvas, Yakshas, and Rakshasas. And see what else it said. Anyway, he was expert in giving all, you know, in uh, describing. Uh, well, I'll just give you a brief over overview of what Prabhupada says here that he taught um, and what he learned from his father. As a bona fide disciple of Sri Vyasadeva, he inquired from his father very extensively. And I didn't know that he inquired from his father. I thought he only overheard his father speaking the Bhagavatam. I didn't know there was a conversation. Uh, he inquired from the father very extensively about religious principles and spiritual values. And his great father also satisfied him by teaching him the yoga system by which one can attain the spiritual kingdom. The difference between fruit of worker and empiric knowledge, the ways and means of attaining spiritual realization, the four ashrams, namely the student life, the householder life, the retired life, and the renounced order, the sublime position of the Supreme Personality of God, the process of seeing Him eye to eye, the bona fide candidate for receiving knowledge, the consideration of the five elements, the unique position of intelligence, the consciousness of the material nature and the living entity, the sy symptoms of the self-realized soul, the working principles of the material body, the symptoms of, in, in, of the influential modes of nature, the tree of perpetual desire, and the psychic activities. Sometimes he went to the sun planet with the permission of his father and Naradaji. Descriptions of his travel in space are given in the Shanti Parva of the Mahabharata 332. And at last he attained the transcendental realm. And then he gives his other names. Um, he had to ask permission to go to the sun planet. And he went up there. I don't know what, why he went to the sun planet, but obviously he was preaching. He was on the preaching mission. I had, there was one, one uh, my old God brothers once wrote a letter to Prabhupada. This was early on, like in 72 or something. And he was saying how, you know, because he was with Prabhupada from the beginning, from 26 Second Avenue, and he thought, well, we've already got it down, Prabhupada. We've got all these centers everywhere. He said, next, we're running out of space, and next we'll have to Go to the moon, Prabhupada, to preach. <laughs> Prabhupada just wrote back, says, oil your own machine first. Mm -hmm. Take care of what you got. You know, don't start dreaming about the moon. Yeah. Yes? <clears throat> also, um, uh, the vision that we might have uh, of the world at the present moment where we are at might have to do with you know, the frustration that we feel by seeing the birds killing each other, I've seen that. Uh, but by what? Excuse me? But, like what she was, Katya was mentioned, that the birds killing each other, the bigger killing the little ones or whatever. Mm. It's also the frustration that we feel because there is a sense of enjoyment in us at all times. Like, why isn't it this world beautiful? That's what I want to see. It's also lack of knowledge. And it's also lack of surrender. Because if we let it go, if we let it be, then we understand that where we are, really, where we're at. This is not idea for anybody. This is not. Prophet says it, it's not a world for a gentleman or a lady. Mm -hmm. So these are the lessons and these are the visions that we have to see to get convinced that this is not it. As, as pretty as it is, as as wonderful as the mall is, bigger stores, bigger, uh, you know, uh, machines or uh, whatever they are inventing. Now we have this new electric car that can, you know, has great right. acceleration and we don't have to worry about destroying the environment, you know, and, it's, you know, we're, we're always creating new or better ways to enjoy. You know, I remember that sometimes when we first started bringing, um, um, devotees from uh, Mayapur over Jabhataka Marsh and um, sometimes some th those devotees, this was in the early 80s and they would see, they would go to a store like Walmart and it was just like, they couldn't believe it. Everything was instant gratification. Everything was there. You could get anything like that. No problem. Like, you know, uh, 
you know, these vending machines. We, we're so used, that's a classic example of instant gratification. I put my money in, I expect that candy bar or that bottle of water. If I don't, I start kicking it, I start shaking it. Where is it? You know, we want instant gratification. But, you know, that's the nature of the material. Some of it looks fantastic. It looks like a, you know, just like Prabhupada said, the mirage of water on the desert. It looks like there's water there. Or at the end, uh, you know, there looks like there's going to be pleasure there. But when you get there, it's frustrating. And that's what it's designed for. And even if you are temporarily, and temporarily may be for millions of of years, even billions of years on the heavenly planet. You're enjoying, but it doesn't last. A Brahma Bhuvana Loka, all places in this universe, from the top to the bottom, are places of misery because there's birth, old age, well, actually, there's an old age in some places, but birth, disease, death, there's birth and death. It doesn't last. You have to give it up. The soul is eternal. That's why we're frustrated. We are anti-material energy or spiritual energy, and this is material energy. The two don't uh, work. We want we want to be eternal. We don't like growing old. I mean, it was probably back around the late eighties. I was um, getting a new driver's license in Tennessee. <coughs> And I filled out the thing, and I, I said, the color of the hair, I said, black. <laughs> and uh, the woman at the counter said, sir, your hair isn't black. <laughs> I said, no, I have black hair. I know, I, I, I've always had black hair. But you don't anymore. <laughs> and then she showed me a mirror, and I go, I, all right. Oh. So, that's why I try to keep it, I, mean, I should keep it shaved up, but... I keep it, try to keep it as short as possible, so I don't have to actually spend any time in front of the mirror. I don't want to be reminded. But we, we, have, we see things, just, you see this, uh, you see these, uh, unfortunately these, these actors, especially the actresses, whose whole career was based on their looks and their youthful beauty, and then they go, they go to incredible measures to try to <clears throat> manufacture that face again. It, it's actually a, a a very ghastly thing they do. The surgery. And then some of them come out looking like lizards. Literally. They can't, you can't tell if they're smiling or if they're sad. You know, because they want to be, because, because we are eternally young. Anyway, the class is long gone, so anybody has to leave, go ahead. Leave. Is there anything, any, anything else anybody wants to say? Yes? Even, I was thinking even within ourselves, like these feelings of being good or being generous or being the best or being the, you know, like with others. Oh, I am so good and still they treat me so hard. How come, how could that be? That's exactly what we have to, to give up, all that. Because as long as we, we continue feeling like I am this, I, I have a brother who is always been in the mother goodness all of his life. But that is the hardest part for him now. Because his children are not being the way he wanted them to be. Because the wife is not. So it's the hardest part of thinking that I have been good all my life. I've given them everything and look the way they pay. Mm -hmm. So, this is what we are, we have to work on. Try. Okay, thank you very much for watching.